Have you ever been after blizzard? Have you ever sat down to rus in with a doomsman or umgripped a jangler after encountering a coke drill? Not sure? Well, be not bemothered or ebobbed because you are about to find out as we look at some of the wonderful medieval words lost to time that I think we should bring back. Welcome to another Rob Words. So this is Herbie. He's 17 years old, he loves words, and he has a lot of time on his hands. That's why he'll soon go on to catalogue every single word used in literature written in English in the 13th century. Herbert Coleridge, grandson of a certain Samuel Taylor Coleridge, had a short life. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 30, but he lived long enough to give us this, his Dictionary of the First or oldest words in the English language, which was published in the 1860s. Now this book is crammed full of wonderful medieval words that were once a part of our language, but are no longer. I've read through each and every one of them, so you don't have to, over a hundred pages of them. And here is my A to Z of words I think we should welcome back. Or at least it would be, but for the fact that there aren't any beginning with Z. The final entries all begin with this letter, which uh, I've talked about in other videos and I will get on to later. Oh, and as for X, yeah, there were none of those either. Time for a whistle stop tour of words. Lots to get through, so let's get cracking. Here we go. And we begin with the beautiful afterblismed, which is an old word meaning pregnant. Now the blismed bit is sort of related to the word Blossom. It evokes the idea of something soon coming into fruition, like the birth of a little baby. It's a much prettier word than pregnant, in my opinion, so that's why I'm giving it three stars for bring back ability. Oh, did I mention I'm going to be rating these? Feel free to disagree in the comments. I'd also like to see the rebirth of this B word, bemothered, which actually sounds like it could be used to describe a baby, but it actually means to be bothered. It's related to the word mither, which still gets used in some British dialects to describe someone who's getting on your nerves. But in medieval times, you may well have been bemothered. Just two stars for this one, though, because it's basically bothered, but you have to bother yourself with two extra letters. Right, let's see what medieval C word I can conjure up. So I've picked coke drill, except it's not coke drill, it's pronounced cockadrill, and it's just another name for a crocodile. Now it may just sound like a toddler making a mess of the actual word, but this and variants of it were actually more commonly used than crocodile up until the 16th century when cockadrill was changed to fit better with the Latin and Greek forms. By the way, did you know that the Greek form crocodilos means worm of the stones? It's suddenly not so scary, is it? We don't really need another word for crocodile, but I do prefer this one, so it gets three stars from me. Now, if worm of the stones somewhat undermines the crocodile's ruthless reputation, the D word I've chosen does the opposite for its owners. It's doomsman, and is a much more formidable word for a judge. Doom in this context actually means judgment, like it does in the term doomsday, and if we throw in Doom's woman as well into the deal, I'd be very keen to see these words replacing judge, which just makes them sound so judgmental, you know? Extra points for epicness, this one gets four stars. Our E word is another long lost job title, Iremonger, and it means egg seller. English has had various words for egg down the years. It often depended on where you were in England, but one of them was ire, and as I talked about in my video about old jobs, munga comes from an old word mango, which was nothing to do with fruit, but meant a trader. Hence an ire munga is an egg seller. Now I'm not sure we even have a word for the specific job of selling eggs these days, correct me if I'm wrong. That's why it's getting a bring back ability score of four stars. Time for an F word. And it's a fiery one, flumberding, meaning a man with a hot temper, and I mean a hot, fiery temper, like this furious man here. Flumberding shares its root with the word flame, and 
I think there is an empty niche in our language for this one, so I'm giving it four stars. Don't get all hot-headed with me if you disagree. Oh wait, hot-head. That kind of means the same thing, doesn't it? Okay, two stars. Okay, let's get going with G and Gale Gale, which means twittering, like a bird, not like Elon Musk. It's the same gale as we get at the end of Nightingale, for example, which is a night singer. I like the idea of walking through the forest, enjoying the gale gale of our feathered friends. It's quite sing-songy itself as a word. Four stars. The H word I'm hoping will stick in your head is hernpan, which means skull. The definition Herbie Coleridge gives is actually brain pan, which is not a word I'd actually come across, but apparently it does get used in the States sometimes, perhaps you know it. Hern simply means brain, and the words for brain in German and the Scandinavian languages today are similar. Skull has scary Viking vibes, cranium is too medical sounding, so I think we have room in our heads for hern pan as well. Just two stars though, because there are those alternatives. Now, if any of my Scandinavian friends were upset by my little Viking jibe a few seconds ago, you may have use for my next word. Ibobbed, which means insulted. This is entirely here because it is satisfying to say. Ibobbed, Ibobbed, Ibobbed. You dare to Ibob me, sir? That's really good. Actually, the word Bob is an old verb meaning to mark. Maybe as a Robert, I shouldn't be advocating for this one, but it's just too satisfying. Four stars. The next one is also satisfying to say. It's jangler. And I actually reckon you could guess what this means because it sounds like what it is. It's a musician. I love the sound of onomatopoeia in the morning. Four stars. Now, a jangler could also be a jester. And there was another less light-hearted use of it that meant someone who basically just talked too much. To jangle was to chatter. Anyway, listen to me prattling on. Let's move on to our K word, which is cumling, meaning a stranger. Now, there are similar words in other Germanic languages. The cum bit means cum, and the ling is a suffix you put after a word to turn it into a noun meaning a person. You with me? It's like um, a changeling, a groundling, or an earthling. So a cumling is someone who came as in someone who isn't from around here. I was actually once on the Isle of Man between England and Ireland, and there they refer to people who aren't native to the island as comeovers. This is kind of like that. I'm actually starting to think it requires too much explaining. To be honest, there were not a lot of K words to choose from. One star for cumling. Let's move on to L and lax. Now, if you're thinking, hang on, Rob, we have that word already. Well, you're right to think there's something fishy going on. But in medieval England, lax actually meant salmon, as it does in Swedish and Icelandic now, and in German, Norwegian, and Danish as well, but it's spelled differently. You may have also eaten gravlax before, which is a salmon dish. Now this word should get five stars just for relieving us of the confusion around that awful L in salmon. I mean, I know lots of non-native English speakers who've reached a really, really high level with the language, but still pronounce that L. Lax gets rid of that particular linguistic booby trap. However, the fact that we already do have a word spelt exactly like that means I have to knock its bring back ability rating down just a notch. Three stars, I reckon. Lord of the Rings fans are going to like our M word. It is Middle Earth, and it means the world. Tolkien very deliberately resurrected and updated this term to name his fictional realm Middle Earth. The term ultimately comes from Scandinavian mythology. To the Vikings, it was Midgather, although you'll have to excuse my excessively British pronunciation. And we also use the word Midgard when talking about one of the nine realms of Norse mythology today. It means the area inhabited by humankind, the middle yard surrounded by sea, that is the domain of civilization. We perhaps don't need the word Middle Earth, but I think Given its story, it's kind of cool. Three stars. Our next word is also here because of the story behind it. It's the Middle English nedder, which means adder. Adder is what we call Britain's only indigenous venomous snake, but the adder itself is a victim. 
a victim of something sometimes called rebracketing or metathesis, where a word loses a letter or letters to the word surrounding it. I did a whole video about it. A neder was often enough misheard as an edda for us to be now left with the word adda when we should have had nada. See also an ute and a numpire. Four stars for bring back ability because it is time to write a historic linguistic wrong. Okay, time for a super old O word, and it gives me great pride to bring you orgulous, meaning proud. It's actually proud more in the sense of arrogant, though. It comes from the French word orgoy. I have to admit, I've cheated a little bit here because orgulous actually stayed around long enough to be used by Shakespeare. It's in only the second line of Troilus and Cressida. But the Bard's endorsement only boosts its bring back ability to my mind. Plus, it's really enjoyable to say orgulous. Three stars. Another fun word to say is the P word I've chosen for resurrection, which is Papa J, which means simply parrot. It's similar to a lot of other Germanic words for parrot. Here in Germany, it's a papagai, but those languages actually imported it from the Romance languages. You may also have come across the word popinjay as an old-fashioned insult, meaning a vain man, and that is evoking the idea of a gaudy, preening parrot. Popinjay is also an old word for parrot. So I'm well up for us reverting to one of these old alternatives to parrot. However, because parrot is still kind of doing an all right job, I'm just giving Papa J a modest two stars. Next in our resurrection quest is Q and the word quirt. In medieval times, quirt meant joyful. If someone was quirt, they were full of heart because it's related to the French word for heart, cur. It's a lovely word and a lovely concept. It also has the added bonus of giving new meaning to the term quirty keyboard. There's space in our lexicon for this one. Four stars for quirt. Right, onto R and the tummy rumbling russin which was a meal between dinner and supper, because apparently some people need to eat three times of an evening. I actually couldn't find out very much about this word. All Coleridge says is that he found it in a poem called The Land of Cocaine. Cocaine here isn't a drug, it's a utopia of sorts, inhabited by flying monks, who actually turn out to be less than holy. Anyway, here you can see that word, rustin. I managed to find an analysis of the poem that said the word perhaps comes from an Irish term, meaning a bite between meals, but let me know if you know any more about it. Either way, I'm going to endorse anything that secures me more food. That's why I am giving Russin a delectable, full five stars. Start using it today to justify that mid-evening Mars bar. Straight on to S and the word spinnendweb. This is one of several words featured in 13th century literature that means spider. Others include Attercop and Irene. Clearly spiders were a big part of medieval life for some reason. I like spin and web because it describes what they do. It means web spinning. Just the one star though, because spider is doing a decent job, really. Also, I'm kind of scared of them and I feel like the more we mention them, the more they might turn up. It's time for tea and the marvellous medieval twiffled, meaning hesitate. It's actually just another way of saying twofold, but it has this extra meaning of being in two minds about something. It's like the German word for doubt is zweifel. I really like twiffled because of that idea it creates of being unable to choose which of two ways to go. We could also do with being rescued from the silent bee in doubt as well. So. Twiffled gets three stars from me. Appropriately, I was in two minds about where to go with my U word, so that's why you are getting the double whammy of umgrip and umclip, both of which meant to embrace someone, to give someone a hug. Um is a Germanic prefix meaning around, so it's as if you are, you know, gripping around someone or clipping yourself around something. The world needs more hugs, so I am giving both of these words four stars. You can take your pick which one to use. Coleridge didn't find a lot of V words, so pickings were slim, but I'm very pleased with Vavasa. Old Herbie gave it this description, which 
I could barely make head and a tail of, but basically Vavasa was a sort of feudal rank directly below a baron. Like most English words of nobility and hierarchy, it comes from French, and ultimately from a Latin term, meaning vassal of vassals, slave of slaves. Vavasa is a wonderfully vivacious word to say, but there's probably a good reason we're not using it anymore, i.e. the patent lack of actual vavasas around. So just one star for vavasa. On to W now, and more double trouble. Firstly, I want to introduce you to the word wiving, which was a medieval term for marriage. A little on the misogynistic side though, and there's probably no place for it in the modern world. So I want to introduce you to its medieval foil as well. Another W word, wed break, which means adulterer, for obvious reasons. Mm, two stars. On to X, except Coleridge didn't find any words beginning with X. So next, why don't we bring back this Y word, yoxing, which means hiccuping. <coughs> I'm mainly advocating for this word's return on behalf of speakers of British English, where we still spell hiccup like this. The reason why is a messy one that I went into in another video, but basically it got changed to fit with the word cough. It is an annoyance we could do without, and bringing back yoxing would free us of it. Four stars, please. Finally, onto our last letter, which is this. No, that isn't a fancy Z, although it has often been mistaken for one. It's an old letter we used to use in English called joch. It can make a few sounds, including the y at the start of joch, the ch at the end of joch, and also just a g sound. The word I've chosen from Herbie Coleridge's joch section is this beauty, which I'm going to pronounce as goggling. It meant chattering or gabbling, and is probably the same as the word gaggle, which according to Coleridge meant the confused noise of people talking. The word was later borrowed and applied to mean a collection of geese, as it still does. But how about goggling as an onomatopoeic alternative to gabbling? I'm up for it. Three stars. And there we are, a whole alphabet's worth of medieval words for you to use today. I'd love it if you could work one into a comment. If you've enjoyed this, check out my video about crazy collective nouns and where they came from, featuring a gaggle of geese, or if you've already seen that one, try this one for size. I'll see you over there, just after I've rustled up a bit of rustin. Yum, 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 yum.